Welcome to To Life L'Chaim. On today's show, we'll talk with Mark Allen Siegel, the chair of the Democratic Party of Palm Beach County, Florida. We'll get the Democratic viewpoint from a Jewish perspective, right after these messages. With us in studio today, we're happy to have with us uh, Mark Allen Siegel, who is chairman of the Democratic Party of Palm Beach County and vice chairman of Florida's Democratic Party. Yes. Mr. Siegel, welcome to, to Life L'Chaim. Delighted to be here and L'Chaim to you as well. Thank you, sir. Um, tell us how your Judaism uh, affected your politics. Well, in every possible way. Uh, first of all, uh, we learned from Pirkei Avot that we have to tend to the state because if you don't have a strong government, people will, as in the words of the deputy high priest, devour each other. So the safety of our government is extremely important. Second, we as Jews exist in the fish, as fish in the water of our civilization. So if that civilization turns hostile, as it has in the past, our lives and our property and our future are endangered. So it's important that we tend to the goodness of our government and pay attention to what's going on around it. That being said, you then begin to think about how our holy scriptures uh, teach us about how we should relate to our fellow people mm -hmm. and the role of government in that. Things like think about uh, the poor and the orphan and the widow. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt and uh, always therefore look out for the weak and the powerless. All of these things are things that affect me in my life every day and of course play an important role in any political decisions that I might be involved in. Uh, Palm Beach County is home to uh, 255,000 plus Jews. Plus, uh, definitely right, plus. plus uh, which is uh, the fourth largest uh, population of Jews in the United States and certainly South Florida uh, combined is over well over 600,000. Yes. Um, so certainly uh, as Florida goes, uh, so goes the nation. We certainly learned that back in 2000 in terms of uh, the, hard, with the hard way. Yes, the hard way, did. yes we did. Um, how is this election shaping up uh, nationally for President Obama? Well it's going to be extremely close and it's going to be very close in Florida. Uh, over the last I think eight presidential elections, somewhere in excess of 25 million votes have been cast and the difference between the two parties' presidential nominees is in the range of 50,000 votes. Mm -hmm. So Florida has always been a very close situation. And naturally, any block of 600,000 people is going to be extremely important in determining the outcome of the election. And as you pointed out, as Florida goes, so goes the nation. So what are your efforts as chairman of the Democratic Party in terms of uh, getting out the vote in support of your candidate? Well, first of all, the Palm Beach County Democratic Party is organized at the neighborhood level. We have people in every community, typical of that community, who are there every week of the year to listen to what their neighbors have to say. And those precinct committee people, those neighborhood team leaders, we meet with us periodically and we want to hear what's going on in the communities. That allows us both to respond uh, to people's needs in an effective, timely fashion, but also allow us to reply to the various uh, big lies that are sometimes disseminated by our opponents, both within the Jewish community and within the population generally. Mm -hmm. What are some of those lies that you believe? Well, for instance, uh, that the President Obama is a Muslim or that President Obama is an enemy of Israel. Uh, if you ask the leadership of Israel, they will tell you that he's one of the best friends that they've ever had. I mean, certainly there's, there's a lot of information that's out there uh, in the media that uh, does dispute some of those points. And let's, uh, let, let's take well, some... Well, let me say, in the media, if you include uh, internet uh, circulations, mm -hmm if you include emails that uh, sometimes are circulated around, there's a lot of misinformation. If you look at the uh, more respectable journals, I'm talking about the national news magazines, the major newspapers, the national networks, none of these things are repeated because they're known to be flat out untrue. Mm -hmm. in, uh, 
In 2008, President Obama received uh, upwards of 78% of Jewish support uh, yes. in the election. Uh, recently, uh, a poll a few months ago had him at uh, down to 61%. Right. A recent Gallup poll has him up to 64%. Right. What's the reasons for the erosion and maybe well, this tick? You, you have to put it in a historical context. Uh, four years ago, at the same time, the president had 59% of the Jewish community mm -hmm. because they needed to learn and be informed of what his positions were. And we're going through the same process again. You notice the trend line is up. Mm -hmm. It will continue to go up, and we expect to receive about the same support, if not more, as the president did four years ago. The reasons for that are pretty clear. Um, we see the horror of missiles falling on southern Israel, on Sirot. Uh, the Iron Dome missile system which the United States has provided under the president's leadership, has been protecting Sirot in a way that has never been protected before, actually intercepting these missiles on their way before they can hurt schools and children and the communities and people. That's just one example. Another example, when the uh, Goldstein report was put out, uh, the president led the opposition to the adoption of that report and was successful when uh, the Palestinian Authority sought to come to the United Nations, avoid direct negotiations with Israel, and be proclaimed a state by the world body, the United States vetoed that effort in the Security Council. And the President spoke to the General Assembly, pointing out how wrong that was. So these are just a few examples of the things that he's done. No president has surrounded himself with more Jewish advisors than has President Obama. Both of his chiefs of staff are members of our community. That's the highest position. More people have been appointed as cabinet members than under previous administrations. Nominees to the Supreme Court include a Jewish woman. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea that the president is somehow distant from the Jewish community or, God forbid, hostile to the Jewish community is refuted by facts. And those facts are gaining traction, gaining currency, and in the end, Jewish voters will know, not just on the issues of Israel, but on the issues of birth control, on issues of family planning, on issues of women's rights, social justice, all of these things will show that the president is more in tune with the Jewish community than any other nominee. That was a very quick first segment, um, but when we're going to come back, we're going to dive into uh, this issue uh, a little bit more. Time flies when you're having fun. Good, beautiful. We'll be right back after these messages. We're back in studio with Mark Allen Siegel, chairman of the Democratic Party of Palm Beach County. Uh, Mr. Siegel, again, welcome to To Life L'Chaim. Delighted to be here. We're, uh, when we, before the break, we were talking uh, about y your belief with respect to uh, President Obama's support among the Jewish community. Yes. And I wanted to, uh, certainly, there are some factors that have caused his uh, erosion, whether you believe they are myths or not. Um, certainly, uh, the president bow, bowing before the Saudi Arabian uh, king. Um, certainly, uh, his reference to the 67 borders. Well, let, let's take the 67 borders, because okay. that's an example of the big lie. Uh, the president said that uh, negotiations have to be between the parties. The parties have to agree on borders. Those borders need to be adjusted from the 67 borders to meet Israel's legitimate security needs. Now, if you take a sentence that says uh, the basis needs to be the 67 borders adjusted to protect Israel's security, and chop off the last four words, you are lying about the president's position and trying to frighten people and fool people. That's just wrong when people do that. The president has always said that, first of all, these things have to be conducted bilaterally, that the Israeli government has to be satisfied with the solution, and second, that the 67 borders must be adjusted to reflect Israel's security needs and to reflect the demographic changes that have occurred since 1967. That is completely, clearly, 100% his position, and any statement to the contrary 
is just a falsehood. But he could have made the same point that you refer to without even referencing the 67 well, orders. Well, no, because that the resolution uh, 242, which is the basis for this, references the 67 borders. Any negotiation needs to have a starting point. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have exchanges of, of uh, land, which was the proposals made both in Oslo and in Camp David, if you're going to have exchanges, then you have to start from somewhere. That's where you start. But that's not where you finish. And the suggestion that Israel should go back to the 67 borders is just not the United States position. Mm -hmm. But certainly you would agree that in an anecdote and in fact there has been an erosion of support among Jews for this president. Well there there's always the 20 percent mm -hmm. that represents the, the, the revisionist Jabotinsky line. These are the same folks who rejected partition in 1948 and would have had no state. These are the same folks who want to drive the Palestinians from their homes, send them over to Jordan, and have the two-state solution be Israel and Jordan. This is not the position of the Israeli government. This is the position only of the most extreme right-wing elements in Jewish, uh, in Jewish and in Israeli society. They represent a small fraction of Jews here and in Israel and around the world. There is no legitimacy to their positions. But they're always going to be there. They're always going to be loud. They're going to be proud of their position. But they have always differed from the government of the state of Israel, including the Begin government and the Netanyahu government, about what the future of the state of Israel should be. And that future involves exchanges of land and the recognition of two states on the western side of the Jordan. Does the Democratic Party believe that Jerusalem should be a divided capital? No. Uh, Jerusalem, let, let's talk specifically about Jerusalem. There are three Jerusalems involved. One is the holy city, the city within the wall, our traditional holy site, and that is going to remain forever Jewish. We're the only people in history who admit, administered it fairly and properly. Every other conqueror has excluded other religions from that uh, city. We're the only folks who have done it right and we're going to continue to do it right. The uh, Temple Mount, the Wall City is forever Jewish. Uh, second, there's the city as it existed before uh, 1967. That was a divided city. There was an Eastern and Western Jerusalem. Uh, that remains uh, a subject of negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis. The third city is the areas that have been added by the municipality since the time of the uh, 67 uh, victory. Mm -hmm. Those areas too need to be subject to negotiation between the government of Israel and its negotiating partners. So when people say all of Jerusalem undivided, you have to ask which Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. Every square inch that the Echud Omer added when he was mayor of Jerusalem is not the traditional Jerusalem. Why should it be up for negotiations when Israel won that in a war that was put upon them? Well, the government of Israel has determined to negotiate with its neighbors to try to find a lasting peace based on territorial exchanges and based on two viable states on the, east side, on the west side of the Jordan River. That's the position of the government of Israel, and I re Provided respect... it can be secure, of course. Yes, of course. Well, th that's why I, I, the President, and the United States look to the government of Israel to negotiate mm -hmm. with a negotiating partner, a partner that accepts its existence as a Jewish state, that uh, accepts existing international agreements, and is determined to end the incitement of hatred uh, of Jews among their own population. If such a negotiating partner emerges, the government of Israel has been clear that it wants to negotiate with that partner without preconditions. The United States government, the President of the United States, the Democratic Party supports the government of Israel in that endeavor. Others oppose that endeavor by the government of Israel. 
uh, there are, the Republican Party's position has been to oppose Oslo, which is the position of the Israeli government. They've been to oppose uh, territorial exchanges, which is the position of the Israeli government. The Republican Party is a prisoner of the revisionist Jabotinsky clique, which has never had the overall good of the state of Israel in, in its heart. We're going to take another break because time is flying. Um, but when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Middle East and also talk about uh, economics and how they'll play a role in uh, the 2012 election. Okay. Okay. We'll be right back. We're back in studio with Mark Siegel. Um, Mr. Siegel, why has President Obama not visited Israel during his first term? Well, remember, he was there twice before he became president, so it's not as if he's never been to Israel. Uh, no president, except for Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton, visited Israel during their first term. Uh, some presidents, much admired, have never visited Israel. Uh, both Carter and Clinton went there because they were actively involved in peace negotiations between uh, Israel and its neighbors. If there had been peace negotiations, I'm sure he would have been there. But just to go as a tourist is not the role of the President of the United States. And as I said, only two Democratic presidents have visited Israel during their first term. This is another example of a fake issue because neither President Bush nor President Reagan nor even George W. Bush uh, visited Israel during their first term. It's just a phony issue. This is the sort of thing that's brought up to distract people. You know, when musicians perform a trick, they like to have some shiny object to keep your eye off what's actually going on. This is an example of a shiny object intended to divert people from the real issues. But the detractors to that position would say that it was a concerted effort by President Obama during his first four years to win over uh, an Arabic population um, following 9-11, um, following that, the, the history that existed during uh, President Bush, that this was his concerted effort to win over an Arabic population. That's why oh, he's not well, visiting well, Israel. No. In fact, his effort has been to persuade the reluctant people to come to the table with Israel. You don't have to go to Israel to persuade Israel to negotiate. You need to go to Cairo and Jeddah and other places which are the centers of resistance and tell them flat out, as he did in Cairo, that they must recognize Israel, they must accept Israel's existence as a Jewish state, and they need to come to the table to make peace. You go to talk to people who need to be moved and persuaded those are the people who need to move and change their position to come to the peace table, and the president went there to try to persuade them. A visit by a president of the United States is not a bonbon, it's a business trip. And that's where the business had to be done, because those are the people who were out of step with the United States policy and needed to be brought into line with the United States policy so they would support peace negotiations. And he has been successful in doing that. Very good. Let's switch gears towards uh, our economy. Okay. Okay. Uh, certainly, uh, the president's recent remarks that the private sector uh, is doing fine, he's taken uh, some level of criticism for. Um, so let's talk about... Okay, well, the pri private sector is actually doing much better than it did four years ago. 3.6 million private sector jobs have been created during his presidency. So it's certainly doing better than the governmental sector because unlike during the prior eight years when the government expanded tremendously both at the state and local level, employment by state and local and federal agencies has been sharply reduced during the Obama presidency. So the, uh, the private sector is adding jobs, not as fast as anyone would like, I don't know that fine is necessarily the best word, but the private sector is making progress, and that's indisputable. Once again, you jump on one word and you say, oh, that's uh, all we should talk about. Wow. The fact is 3.6 million additional jobs in the private sector is substantial progress opposed to the loss of over 5 million jobs in the private sector during the prior administration. 
Well, there um, certainly there's statistics that speak to uh, that a underemployment is significantly high. Yes. Um, and millions of people have le left the workforce. So the same basis that is being used to determine an 8.1 to I'm not 3%. talking about the unemployment rate. I'm talking about actual jobs that have been added, payroll mm -hmm. jobs which are now putting people back to work. That's a plus sign, regardless of the unemployment rate, which as you point out is affected by a lot of factors. More people are working now than were working three and a half years ago. There, but there is statistics that talk to the fact that there's a million less jobs that have, uh, that have existed since um, in January 2009 when President Obama took office versus uh, where that labor pool I, I, I is I think today. that may be including an adjustment for the many government jobs that have disappeared. School teachers, firefighters, police have been laid off because of the refusal of the Republican Congress to continue programs that have existed for years to help local governments protect their citizens, mm -hmm. to keep first responders on the job, to keep teachers in the classroom. This is part of the overall picture. Right. We have about two minutes left and so much to discuss. Um, but in terms of this country that has a burden of approximately 60 plus trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities, uh, how can we <clears throat> manage that public sector in terms of uh, salaries and pensions well into the future? Well, first, in you, this current climate. First, first of all, you need to be more like states like New York, a strong democratic state whose pension funds have virtually no deficits mm -hmm. uh, because they have relied on sound actuarial principles. Uh, the Social Security Trust Fund was made actuarially based rather than pay as you go uh, back in the uh, 1980s and is much better now than it would have been if President Reagan and the Democratic uh, members of Congress hadn't gotten together and agreed on a plan increasing revenues. Right now, revenues are at the lowest percentage of uh, general uh, uh, the general economy than they've been in a century. Uh, there needs to be some attention to the revenue side as well as just to the spending side. So in terms of governments, in terms of what transpired in Wisconsin, uh, overturning the recall election. Let, let the recalls, recalls are a bad idea. There never should have been a recall. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in recalls. You elect someone for a term, they should stay there for that term. And I think the American people generally feel that way. It's very rare that a recall succeeds. Well, this time with us together has gone very, very quickly. Um, so we hope you'll come, get, come back uh, to us. Whenever invited, I'll be happy to join you. Very good. Tell us uh, how our audience can get in touch with you. Well, uh, you can write to me at uh, pbcdemocraticparty.org. Uh, that's our website. You can write to M Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L, at pbcdemocraticparty.org. And our website is, of course, www.pbcdemocraticparty.org. Very good. Mr. Siegel, thank you very much for joining thank us you. today. Thank you. Pleasure. That's it for this edition. For more information on our show, please visit us on the web at tolifelechaim.com. I'm Lee Lazarson. Thank you very much for joining us. And to life, L'chaim.